to resolve this paradox, we are going to have to look at how structural engineers handle risk. Let's now consider some sources of risk that engineers need to consider. So when considering risk, uh, there are several distinct categories that structural engineers need to consider. So I'm just going to look at a series of these categories and discuss where some of the um, variability, some of the, uh, well, risk originates. So first, let's look at uncertainty and loads. And let's think about the types of loads we need to design our structures to resist. Well, we have things like vertic we have vertical loads. And these would be things like gravity and live load. And then we have, you know, lateral loads, uh, things like wind and seismic. And there are many other loads as well, things like rain load, um, snow load, you know, and you can get in some, uh, then you can get into some very rare and specialized loadings like tsunami or blast or fire, that sort of thing. But uh, consider something like wind load. When we're designing a structure for wind load, we need to first calculate wind load, and there are procedures in the ASC 7 for that. But uh, with any kind of environmental loading, we're going to have some sort of uh, assumed event. So we're going to have a certain, you know, we'll have a certain windstorm, for example, that, we might, that might be used as the model design um, based on a um, 50, 100, 500 year return period, that sort of thing. And you'll end up having some sort of uh, some sort of assumed height versus um, uh, relationship of height versus wind speed. And you may use this to, this is one method you might use to design your um, building or structure for wind. Uh, however, again, this is based on past environmental data. Um, past op we take observations of the environment, we measure wind speed at various heights, and from that we come up with estimates for, each, for any given location and um, try to come up with our best guess uh, for um, a design windstorm event. But there's always going to be some uncertainty in this. We can never, um, you know, for example, if we assume a peak wind speed of 150 miles per hour, um, and we calculate that that's going to be, a, or we predict that's on a 500 year return period, meaning, of course, that that's a 1 in 500 chance of occurring. Um, there's always, that doesn't mean statistically that we'll never see any uh, wind over 150 miles per hour. There's always a chance of some, uh, some larger event beyond what we assumed and beyond what we designed, um, and be, or beyond what we've observed in our data. So uh, there's always some uncertainty with that. And it even occurs with things like live load. So for example, if you have, um, uh, you know, if you're looking at ASC 7 and, or the building codes, you'll find uh, methods of estimating live load depending on building use. So for example, you'll see, you know, um, if you're doing, you know, this type of use, use A, maybe it says use 50 PSF uniform live load across your floor. Um, however, there's always some uncertainty in that, and um, not just in the total amount of load, but how it's positioned. So, for example, if if uh, if you have all of your live load positioned uniformly on a floor slab, you'll get one kind of um, shear and bending moment. If you have all of that positioned near the center, you'll have another shear and bending moment diagram, and that will induce different shears and stresses within your beam. Um, so, and uh, it's it's and when you get into multi-base structures, large structures, you can't even just say, oh, what if we just assume the largest all point at the center or something, all point at the center or something. There is always some uncertainty. Or if you assume a certain value of PSF, there's always a chance that somebody does that 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 that, that one particular part of that structure or that full structure will end up being loaded um, to a larger amount. Um, with any kind of loading, no matter what you do. There's always going to be a certain amount of risk, and that's why we have to ha have to have things like LRFD and AST procedures, um, and those handle uh, that. One of the things they take into account is uh, uncertainty in loads. Next, let's consider the second category of risk, and that's uncertainty in material. So this is definitely a thing that occurs with uh, wood, but that's this is even something that occurs with something. Um, as controlled and familiar as, say, steel. So, for example, if you have, um, let's say you have 
uh, 50 KSI steel. Well, that 50 KSI refers to a yield stress of 58, or sorry, 50 KSI, 50 kips per square inch, 50,000 pounds per square inch. However, what that really is, is a rated minimum. In other words, if you are a steel mill and you're selling 50 KSI steel, um, you are guaranteeing that to a certain level of uh, significance that your minimum standard is going to be, or your minimum yield strength is going to be 50 KSI. So if you were to actually go and perform a large number of tests, um, let's say you did number of tests, and yield strength. So let's say I go and call up a whole bunch of steel mills, you know, I call up a, a 20 steel mills around the, around the country and have them each send me uh, 100 samples of uh, 50 KSI steel. Or maybe I order uh, 100 uh, steel elements from each of them and then I cut out samples uh, to measure. And then I put them in a testing machine and I measure the uh, strength. Well, what I might find is something like this. You know, if I actually go and plot the number of tests, if I plot out these things, I might end up with something, well, it shouldn't surprise you that I might end up with something kind of like a normal distribution. Actually, let me do these as dots instead of Xs. That's going to be a little bit clearer, I hope. So maybe, uh, let's say 50 KSI is here. That's, again, the nominal rated capacity. And maybe we have a series of a series of tests, and some of these are going to be high, uh, are going to be much higher than fifty. Some are going to be way higher than fifty, and the vast majority will be higher than fifty. But a couple may be less than that, or a couple probably will be less than fifty. So what you ultimately would end up with is some sort of normal or log normal distribution. This is a statistics game. So um, again, there is, oh, we can't just, if, if you're ever making something physical, you know, again, engineers deal with the physical world. Structural engineers and any type of engineer deal with uh, things that actually exist in the real world. And in the real world, if you're trying to make something, you can't make it have, even if you're completely controlling the chemistry, like say steel, you can't make it have exactly 50 KSI. Um, when you see a stamp on a piece of steel that says 50 KSI, that is a minimum rating, and the steel mills will design their processes such that they'll, they'll aim to hit a minimum of 50, and they'll err on the side of, the, uh, of greater than 50 or greater than less than 50. So if you were to actually go and measure the average, the average might be something like, oh, I don't know, 58 KSI. So the rated might be 50. The average, if you actually test, tested a bunch of samples, would be 50, maybe 58 KSI or so. And you might see uh, values all the way from, say, 48 to, you know, 80 KSI on the high end. So there is always going to be some uncertainty in the actual strength of material. Now, especially for man-made materials like steel, that's going to be relatively low, and you're going to it's going to err on the side of safety. However, with something like wood, wood is not a natural material, or sorry, wood is not an, a, a man-made material. It is a natural material. And its uh, properties are going to have much more of a normal distribution. And so, if you, in other words, um, as a tree actually grows, it has all sorts of variations in chemistry. So if you look at, say, a property like, you know, um, bending stress in wood, um, and then maybe like number of samples. So if I go and get a whole bunch of um, pine samples and run some uh, bending tests on them, I'm going to find some sort of normal type distribution, or maybe a log normal, depending on how things are set up, but I'm going to get this kind of distribution. So now this is not a, I'm not trying to do a full course in structural reliability, so I'm not going to go too deep into the statistics here, but the key is, is that the key thing to remember is that there is inevitably going to be some sort of uncertainty and spread in your actual strength of material. And that's, that variability is going to intrinsically be higher with a natural material like wood than a man-made material like steel. Um, and, and concrete is probably in the middle because it is a man-made material, but uh, when you're making something of 
when you're making a composite material like concrete, there's always, you know, you have different types of aggregate, uh, different grades of cement, that sort of thing. It's a, very more, it's a much more uh, non-homogenous uh, type mixture than steel is. So inevitably you have a bit more variability. So in terms of amount of variability, steel would be the lowest, concrete would be in the middle, and then wood would be way at the top because wood is a natural material. And here, when I say uncertainty in material in wood, I am talking about like if you were to do a bending test on not even considering things like defects, just looking at like if I did if I created a whole series of samples out of nothing but perfectly straight or within a certain uh, margin, nearly straight grain, uh, no knots, no checks, no cracks, all clear wood. So I'm not dealing with any kind of local defects. And I, you know, use precision machining to make sure all of the samples are, you know, dead on within four decimal places of the exact same dimension. Even then, just out of raw material strength of clear wood, I would have some spread of material strength for any kind of wood property that I'm measuring, whether that's bending stress, um, compression stress, tensile stress, shear, whatever it might be, there's going to be some uncertainty in the material. Now, the next sort of uh, uncertainty that I'd like to mention is uncertainty in geometry. And this comes from a few places. Um, well, two, uh, at least for wood, there's two main sources of this. Uh, one would be the section, and two would be defects. So we have variation in the section size itself, and then I should probably say section size instead of just section. And the next would be defects, local defects, or even global defects in a certain cases. So um, section size. When we have something like a two by four, uh, we'll say that it has, well, it has nominal dimensions of two inches by four inches, but it, we will say it has assumed actual dimensions of 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. And that's what we refer to as a two by four. Now, is that exactly 1.5 inches or exactly 3.5 inches? In other words, is this 1.500000, uh, an infinite number of zero inches? No, of course not. I mean, if you actually go and uh, take a two by four and measure it with a, you know, a very high precision caliper or something, now, I'm not sure the exact spread that you would find, but you would be lucky if they were all with the, they were all within a 30 second of an inch of uh, 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. A 30 second would actually be pretty good on that. And the reason for that, well, there's a, a variety of them. First, um, there's always going to be some variability at the actual sawmill. If you're, um, you know, at the end of the day, or actually, I guess in this case would be the beginning of the day, you have to, uh, if you're talking about steps in industrial processes, you have to actually cut these things out of a, a tree trunk, out of or out of a limb of, or out of a large limb of a tree, and so um, there's always going to be some variation. You know, if you have a a log here, and you're cutting out a series of boards from this, if your uh, saw blade ends up going, you know, le to the left or to the right by the sixty fourth of an inch, which is very easy to happen, um, suddenly that's going to result in a a section size on your board or on your two by four that is slightly larger or slightly smaller. So there's inevitably a certain amount of variation just from the sawing process. And you get other variations in section, uh, even beyond cutting, just from changes in moisture content. Um, in the previous two lectures, we looked at nothing but moisture content. We looked at um, some of the causes of this, some of the things, some of the, some of the, um, differences between uh, lateral and tangential, or sorry, I shouldn't say lateral, I should say tangential and radial directions. Um, and we even looked at um, how di we learned how difficult it is even to directly calculate the amount of shrinkage that occurs because of moisture content. And in the end, we said the best thing we can do is to use an approximate method that just sort of, you know, is fudges a little bit and makes a, a best case approximate guess, or I shouldn't say guess, I should say estimate for uh, wood shrinkage for, cal uh, well, that's a conservative assumption or a conservative estimation, but um, the, the best thing we could do is to assume effectively 6% uh, shrinkage between 30% and 0%, regardless of species of tree, regardless of grade of wood, regardless of orientation of grain, simply because there are too many other variables to reliably perform. So 
really the best thing you can do is to just perform a, a generic best estimate. But anyway, so um, because of this, if you think of a single piece of wood that uh, undergoes expansion and contraction with changes in humidity, there's inevitably going to be changes in cross section. Now, if you think about uh, changes in cross section with, say, moisture content, um, now at first, for certain types of load, you might say, well, does that really matter? I mean, if the, think about this, if you're talking about compression and tension members, if the member slightly expands or slightly contracts, does that really matter? And I would say for compression and tension members, if we ignore um, buckling, it probably doesn't matter much. And the reason for that is that um, as, as a wood member expands or contracts uh, with changes in moisture content, um, you might have uh, you know less cross section, but it's still the same amount of wood actually there. It's more like just the, you have to imagine, you know, wood is a series of straws and it's more like the, as the wood expands and contracts, let me draw this a little better. It's more like the wood um, straws just become uh, more spread apart. So they go from maybe here to here. Um, it's still the same amount of straws and the same actual amount of wood at each cross section. The only difference is that they're further spread apart or less spread apart. So I can kind of think of, if I, in tensile capacity, I wouldn't, in terms of like say tension, I wouldn't expect the tensile capacity to change much with um, changes in moisture content. However, what about something like bending? With bending, your rectangular cross section, that's all dependent on I, your moment of inertia, which of course is equal to BH cubed over 12. That's a really bad three even for me. Uh, that's BH cubed over 12, which means uh, bending capacity is all about how far you have different bits of material from the neutral axis. And so if this thing expands, lengthwise, I shouldn't say lengthwise, uh, in terms of height, if it gets taller, even slightly, you can get a, um, even a slight increase in height can mean greater bending capacity, or even a slight decrease in height can mean uh, lower bending capacity. Even I mean, as it shrinks down, yes, the fibers will be close, more closely spaced, and then in theory able to resist slightly higher stress, but um, Again, I think that effect would be more than canceled out by the fact that now you have a much smaller um, uh, uh, modulus of elasticity, sorry, not modulus of elasticity, moments of inertia. So you might effectively get a larger allowable stress at compression, max compression or tension of fiber, but um, your moment of inertia would be decreasing uh, to the power of H uh, or H to the power of three. And so with, especially with bending, you can't rely on that. You can't just hand wave that and say, oh, um, if, uh, yes, the fiber, yes, the thing might expand, but the fibers will be more for, further spaced apart, et cetera, um, because of the uh, nonlinear relationship between beam depth and uh, bending capacity. So it gets a little bit tricky there. So in, in terms of bending capacity, you actually do have uh, real changes in bending capacity just from expansion and contraction. So that's uh, one source of uncertainty in geometry. And another is, of course, just going to come from all of your defects. If you have a board with a big old knot that has fallen out of it, that is not going to be able to obviously calculate, or is that is obviously not going to be able to carry, um, or where that hole is, is obviously not going to be able to kill it, carry any stress. Air can't carry stress. And so, um, you know, maybe uh, right here, maybe right here, the cross section looks like this, but right here, it looks something like this. It's a much reduced cross section at that location because of a nod or a crack or a check or whatever that might be. Actually, should, that's, that's probably more appropriate just for that uh, knot there. But let's say you have a crack or a check or something at this location here. So you have a split right there, basically. If I then go and take a uh, cross section of this, um, instead of having this nice uh, uniform square or rectangle, effectively what I have is something like this. I, ac I actually have two individual cross sections 
that won't remain in perfect uh, elastic cohesion with each other at that section because they can't because they are literally separate pieces. So um, local defects are, enough, for, especially for wood, are a constant source of, of uncertainty in geometry. Um, again, this is just another aspect where wood as a natural material has a lot more variability and uncertainty, and this is something we need to consider when designing with wood. Next, let's consider uncertainty in analysis. So when I say uncertainty in analysis, in analysis I'm not talking about errors. I'm not, ta I'm not talking about, uh, you know, if, if I go and uh, make an, a, especially a profound error in an, an analysis or design, that's not something we can really uh, take into account just by uh, uh, designing uh, a certain amount of factor of safety or load factor or resistance factor in our procedure. Because unlike other things, um, other sources of uncertainty, there is literally no limit on the potential damage on errors. So again, this is going to, is, is not really for errors. So for example, um, looking back at our table, uh, our previous table, we said that for, uh, again, for Alaskan cedar select structural, we had an FB, a bit allowable bent reference bending stress, again, mo unmodified, of course, of 1150 PSI. Uh, 1150 PSI, uh, again, four dimensional lumber. Uh, however, if I, if I am, uh, I don't know, if I'm being really dumb or I'm asleep at the wheel or if I show up to work drunk or something, um, something I'm not in the habit of doing, by the way, um, if I go and I say, oh, if I'm scr uh, scribbling this down and I get this number from, uh, the, uh, from the supplement and I say, oh, FB, that is 11,500 PSI. Hmm. That is just, that's a very easy mistake to make. Well, I don't know if it's actually a very easy mistake to make, but at least in this particular case, but powers of 10 mistakes are something I think every engineer has done at some point. Um, hopefully not in the actual design process though, or hasn't gone uh, uncaught. That's why we check our work and have others review our work. But um, anyway, that's the kind of mistake that's very easy to make. Um, or maybe maybe not directly caught when directly copying a value from a table, maybe uh, just misplacing a decimal in some calculation somewhere. That kind of thing is very easy to happen, especially when doing things like unit conversions. So, um, but the thing with this is that this would result in a 10x factor of uh, of error, a 10x error factor in my uh, um, final result. And so there is no real, there, without, I mean, I suppose I could use a factor, say if you a thousand or something, but um, there's no method that I can really use to compensate for this kind of uh, uncertainty. If I make a mistake, the potential damage I can cause is infinite. I cannot mathematically compensate. I, I can't just apply a certain um, factor of safety or load or resistance factor and say, okay, to this degree of certainty, I have compensated for this kind of uncertainty um, or this kind of risk. So, or I've accounted for it. I can't do that with mistakes. So this is, again, not for errors. What it is for is inaccuracies due to assumptions. Or really, I could say it's uncertainty uh, in things like design assumptions. Uh, models and methods. Engineering is all about simplifying the world. And if we're going to actually ever design something or engineer something, we need to have ways of actually, uh, of simplifying things, of modeling them, of removing uh, all of the complexities, not all of the complexities, removing enough of the complexities um, and making, basically, when we design an engineering model, we're trying to take a real world complex thing and make a series of intelligent and conservative assumptions that will allow us to actually design something. So for example, 
consider something like the simply supported beam. This is a common uh, design assumption when calculating bending moment shear, etc. A simply supported beam. We might assume a simply supported beam with a uniform load across the top, or a uniform load across it. However, is that actually 100% correct? No, it cannot be. Um, in reality, it is physically impossible for a 100% perfect simply supported beam to exist. Cause, because, and the reason for this is that, again, as by definition, a uh, simply supported beam, if you look at the resisting forces here, the supporting forces, we have just two axial forces, or sorry, not axial forces, two vertical forces, and a potential horizontal resisting force, but there's no resisting moment capacity. However, in any kind of real-world system, you're going to actually have some moment capacity um, in any kind of real support. So, for example, if I have a 2x4, even if it's just resting on a surface, even if it's just resting on a surface, so think about this. Is there is there going to be, uh, in order for this thing to have any, if, if this is a basically a 2x4, not even nailed down, just laying directly on, a, say, a cinder block or something. In order for this thing to have some moment capacity, there has to be some ability to generate a couple. I need to be able to have one force going in one direction and another force going in another direction. Something like this. I need to be able to have a couple and I need to be able to have some separation there. Now the separation is very easy because any kind of support has some physical dimension, so that's not a problem. Um, and the downward force here, well actually it depends on how, from what element's perspective I'm talking about this, but if I'm saying this is from the perspective of the beam, um, this upward force is no problem because that's just the reaction force from the support. But what kind of, how am I going to get a downward force if this thing is just resting on there? Well, I know that in reality, if you zoom in on the microscopic, surfaces are not perfectly smooth. There's always going to be a rough kind of surface. Um, once, if you zoom down into the microscopic, uh, every surface, even you know, a piece of highly polished marble or glass, is going to have, uh, if I zoom in really, really close, it's going to have you jumble, it's going to have, you know, peaks and valleys, it's going to have hollows, it's like, no, there is no such thing as a perfectly smooth surface, especially with any kind of material that we would use in construction. And so, if you have two uneven surfaces, when one rests on top of the other and they deform around each other a little, a little bit and that kind of thing, you can always end up with the surface of one slightly embedding in the surface of another. And through that, even on two very smooth surfaces, not nailed together, not glued, not screwed down, just literally resting on each other, when I, when I go then to separate them apart, there will be some small amount of tensile stress that needs to be applied to separate those two things. Every time you put two surfaces in contact with each other, they are going to bond together a very small amount. Now, this is nothing. I mean, a two by four sitting on top of a cinder block in each end, for example, um, uh, that is the amount of force required to lift that up is, um, is probably imperceptibly smaller than the actual weight of the beam. I would be, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to uh, lift this beam up that's just resting on two cinder blocks, or if I want to be technical, I, I should say concrete masonry units, um, if I have a two by four resting on two cinder blocks, I know in theory, the amount of force required to lift that thing back up is going to be slightly, slightly, slightly more than the actual weight of the two by four, just because there's that tiny, 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 insignificant bonding force between, um, between the uh, two contact points, or between the support contact points, the two surfaces. Um, and because, but of course, if I were to actually try to pick that up by hand, I wouldn't be able to notice that. I would, uh, I, if I had, in other words, when I go to lift it, when I go to actually lift it, I'm not going to notice any decrease in force after I actually break contact with the object beyond maybe like inertial forces and things. But 
So anyway, you would probably need some highly precise piece of laboratory equ equipment to actually measure that tiny, tiny bit of surface bonding. But I know in theory at least that it's there. So what that means is that, and the reason I'm bringing up the simply supported beam is that this is an assumption we make all the time in structural analysis for designing beams and um, walls and things like that. And so um, it's a very common assumption, but I know that even if I purposely try to design a perfectly simply supported beam, in other words, like I, you know, I have a beam of, let's say I have a beam made of glass, perfectly polished, smooth glass, on two supports that are also perfectly polished smooth glass or as polished as I can get it when I rest those on top of each, when I rest that glass beam on those glass supports I know there is going to be a very 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 tiny amount of bonding force between those two and because of that if I have the ability to generate forces in opposite directions and the ability to separate them I know that that uh, support must just by basic physics have some tiny, tiny, tiny amount of um, moment capacity. So in other words, even if I deliberately try to create a perfectly simply supported condition, that is physically impossible. There is no such thing as a perfectly simply supported beam. And this goes for all of the engineering assumptions that we might make. I might think I could make a fixed assumption and say that, uh, and maybe I can avoid the problem and just say, okay, fine, screw it, I'll, just, I'll assume it's fixed. But this is also an idealization. So with a fixed support, I am assuming that when I apply a load or when I apply a moment on that support, that it undergoes zero rotation. I'm assuming the rotation is zero radians exactly with the uh, fixed support assumption. Again, this is basic mechanics. When I assume a fixed support, I'm assuming zero rotation there. That is impossible. If I have a, you know, if I have a tremendous, uh, I don't know, like a, let's say I have a one foot by one foot solid steel column, such so as this gigantic, or maybe not a column, let's say a block. I have a one foot by one foot by one foot solid steel block. And I come along and I put a tiny little hanger, and from that I hang a feather. I literally hang a feather from that. Well, what that's going to do is that's going to introduce a moment, and I would be perfectly justified in assuming a fixed support there. You know, we have this one cubic foot of, of solid high strength steel, and the only thing, only load being applied to it is literally the weight of a feather and maybe like a moment arm of, say, I don't know, one inch or something. So a tiny little load, a tiny little moment arm, and it's being resisted by this just ungodly heavy hunk of solid steel. It would be perfectly fine to assume um, zero rotational deformation there. However, I know that even this tiny load, and even with this tiny moment arm, that beam is still going to undergo a small amount of rotation. Now, it's probably, it's probably going to be so small that even with high precision lab equipment, I might not be able to measure it, but any load and any moment is going to generate some small amount of deformation. All materials, no matter how strong, will undergo some deformation from even the smallest load. That's just basic physics. Um, at the end of the day, materials are made of atoms. They're held together by interacting electric fields or the interacting electric fields of the atoms. And just like any kind of, just like a spring and applying a force, if you apply a small amount of force between two atoms, the distance between them is going to increase ever so slightly uh, or decrease ever so slightly. It's gonna change ever so slightly. So the smallest of loads will cause a small deformation. So. What I'm getting at with this kind of uncertainty and analysis is that any kind of design assumption we make is going to have some um, uncertainty or imprecision to it. Now, uh, in uh, normally when we and most of our design assumptions are nowhere near as perfect or uh, as uh, as accurate as the kind of extreme cases I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about like. Um, you know, I, I talked about having a smooth, perfectly smooth glass beam resting on two glass plates for my best attempt at a um, simply supported beam. 
I talked about my uh, ridiculous one foot cu cube of steel hanging a feather from that to approximate a fixed support. Um, in reality, we have other things that are much, much less perfect than these, but we still approximate them as a, um, a simply supported condition. So for example, you might have a joist hanger. If you're talking about wood design, you might have something like a joist hanger. So you have a, a beam and then you have some sort of joist hanger that bolts the side of a beam and then you, you drop your joist down into this. Well, that joist is going to end up bumping up against the side and rubbing against the side of that joist hanger. And sometimes you need to hammer them down into place. Uh, sometimes you even, need to, you even need to hammer the joist down into place to get it into that support. So sometimes it's actually gripping it with a decent amount of force. And so you end up with something that we still call a simply supported support because compared to the bending capacity of this joist here, the bending capacity or the moment capacity of that joist might be very small. That connection is very small. Um, but assuming you're not actually like applying any kind of bolts in this direction. And we'll talk more about this kind of thing later if you're not, if you're later in the course, if you're not, uh, can't quite visualize what I'm getting at here. But uh, with our connections that we um, approximate as simply supported as fixed or fixed support, there's always going to be some variation in actual behavior. And that's what I mean by uncertainty in analysis. There are always going to be some variation in design assumptions, the models we use, and the methods we use. And we need to have a way of accounting for that uncertainty. And that's one of the things that ASD and LRFD procedures are calibrated for. Finally, I want to look at one other thing, and that's consequences of failure. So I wouldn't necessarily call this a source of uncertainty. However, I would say it's something that we uh, factor in at the same time as uh, considering uncertainty. So what I mean by this is uh, the easiest way to visualize this is to imagine the difference, the difference between, say, uh, beams and columns. So for example, a building, if you, if you look at your typical building, let's just look at a simple idealized building multi-story building. In most cases, uh, columns are going to be more critical than uh, beams. So uh, imagine what happens if, say, this beam right here fails. Well, if this beam right here fails, let's say it just it fails catastrophically. Let's say the worst case scenario happens and it just sort of snaps right in half and you end up with pieces of beam and pieces of floor falling down to the next la uh, layer below. Now, that would be pretty bad. That would be um, whatever was on that floor, including potentially people, uh, would be falling down onto the floor below, um, potentially on top of other people who are there as well. So. Um, we don't treat failures, even of beams, as something that's a trivial matter. We definitely don't want a single beam to fail in a structure. Um, however, if that beam here fails again, if that, again, if that beam here fails, that is what we would refer to as a localized failure. It's only going to affect just this little portion of the structure. It's not going to cause a catastrophic uh, failure that brings the whole building down. What about something like this column here? If that column there fails, we'll look at what elements are going to fail. If that column fails, uh, this element fails, this element fails, this, 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 and this. Oh, and this. And probably in the process might actually bring down the entire building. So um, depending on how the building structure actually works and how things are connected and that sort of thing. But if you knock out the entire bay of a structure, it has a, um, the entire section of a structure does have a good chance of just bringing the whole thing down, uh, literally dragging down the entire thing. But um, anyway, again, we can see here that the consequences of failure, um, the consequences of failure can be much worse for the failure of one type of element and then another type of element. So when we're putting on, um, when we're putting together resistance factors or factors of safety, we typically use larger 
um, margins for uh, columns than we do for beams. Simply because the consequent, usually if a beam fails, typically it's only going to affect what that beam is carrying. But typically a column is carrying not only itself, but also the column above it, the column above that, um, numerous beams, gritters, that sort of thing. In a typical structure, typical, you know, or a perf you know, your kind of idealized, you know, grid line type building, uh, all of you, your columns, uh, if they fail, it's going to be much more critical or much worse than if a beam fails. So you really want to have a larger margin on the column capacity than on the beam capacity. And this is, again, just something we would consider when uh, calibrating our either factors of safety or our resistance and load factors.